Hi there. For every current debate in the news or on social media, you can find many people all giving their thoughts and opinions. But think about it, who do you actually want to listen to? The people who consider the evidence and who acknowledge that things are rarely black and white? Or the people who say whatever they think without paying attention to the facts? Sticking to facts and logic, rather than feeling an opinion, is known as being objective. Being slow to jump to conclusions and acknowledging that things aren't black and white is known as being tentative. In this video, we're thinking about how we can improve our writing with objective and tentative language. Objective writing is impersonal writing. So when we write objectively, we keep our distance from what we're writing about. Let's look at the key ways that you can make your writing more objective. Firstly, objective writing is based on facts and logic, not personal opinion. When you write for an academic audience, everything you claim must be based on evidence from sources and any conclusions you draw have to be based on logical reasoning. So in terms of your writing, this means you shouldn't need to write phrases like I think or in my opinion. Now, there might be exceptions where you're specifically asked to say what you think on a topic, but most of the time this isn't the case. Secondly, to write objectively, you should avoid too much personal reference. If your writing contains a lot of references to I, me, my, you may need to think about whether you're really being objective enough. When you stick to facts and evidence, you don't really need to refer to yourself very often. But notice that I'm saying you should avoid referring to yourself too much. So I'm not saying never ever do it, because in some cases it is useful. In particular, if your work involves collecting primary data by yourself or as part of a team, you might use phrases like, I conducted a survey or we gathered data in describing how you or you and your colleagues did that. Different fields of study also differ in how much writers tend to refer to themselves. If you're in doubt, take a close look at some articles from your field of study. Do the authors refer to themselves in the text? If so, in what contexts? Try to follow their example. One type of personal reference that academic writing almost never contains, though, is the words you and your. When we write, we're presenting an argument or some evidence to the reader, but we're not addressing them personally. So, although academic writing is a kind of discussion, we never address the reader directly as you. So, academic writing is writing in a way that's objective, presenting evidence, but we also need to be cautious in how we present that evidence. We call this kind of cautious language tentative language. As well as tentative language or cautious language, you might also hear the term hedging. All of these terms come down to the same thing, being careful about drawing conclusions and acknowledging grey areas. So, why do we need to use cautious or tentative language? Well, you already know by now that not all sources are equally reliable. And you also know that academic research is an ongoing discussion. We don't claim to know all of the facts yet. And that ongoing discussion also involves debates too, because most evidence is open to interpretation. However, even with all this uncertainty, we still want to use the sources and build on them to offer our own contribution. Therefore, we use cautious or tentative language to present our sources and evidence because tentative language allows us to use claims and evidence in our writing while still acknowledging all the debate and uncertainty that's out there. To see how to do this, let's take an example. Allowing mobile phones in class leads to low grades. Now, this statement is very bold. It doesn't allow for any exceptions or any grey areas at all. 
So what that means is, if a reader could show us one class where students used phones and got high grades, we'd be proven wrong. Let's see what happens when we soften this statement. Allowing mobile phones in class may lead to low grades. May is a modal verb, and the effect of using this modal verb here is to soften the statement to allow for a certain amount of disagreement or discussion. You'll notice that it's now much harder to argue against this statement. Other modal verbs we could use here with the same effect are can, could, and might. A different way to soften this statement is to make it less absolute. So we can allow for the fact that it may not be true in every single case. To do this, we can use words like often, or sometimes, or likely, or typically. These words are known as quantifiers and qualifiers. Allowing mobile phones in class often leads to low grades. Allowing mobile phones in class is likely to lead to low grades. You can see that by adding these words, we've opened up the possibility for exceptions. By saying that something often happens, we're allowing for the fact that it might not always happen. By saying something is likely to happen, again, we're acknowledging that there's also a small chance that it won't happen. Even when we use modals, quantifiers and qualifiers, we're still presenting this statement here as if we believe in it fully. But we can actually get more flexibility if we distance ourselves from the statement. Allowing mobile phones in class appears to lead to low grades. Now we're only saying that it appears or seems that allowing mobiles in class leads to low grades. In other words, we're allowing for possible evidence in the future that reveals that it isn't actually the case. Another way to distance yourself is to use a framing phrase, as in this example. According to many university lecturers, allowing mobile phones in class leads to low grades. Now it's no longer my statement, it's something that many university lecturers have said, and, well, maybe we disagree with them. This way, we're allowing for the existence of other points of view. Combining these different approaches gives you even more flexibility to express exactly the amount of certainty that you want. So, in this example, we've combined framing, according to many university lecturers, with the modal verb may. According to many university lecturers, allowing mobile phones in class may lead to low grades. In this example, we've combined distancing, it seems that, with the qualifying phrase, is likely to. It seems that allowing mobile phones in class is likely to lead to low grades. At first, you may feel like using tentative language makes your writing sound weaker, because you're making your statements softer and less absolute. However, using tentative language actually makes your writing stronger. Why? Because your claims are now more realistic, and you've already taken possible objections and exceptions into account. So, in this video, we've looked at how to be objective and tentative in your writing. Remember that in academic writing, we always use evidence and logic to make a point, not emotion or opinion. And that means that we use objective, impersonal language. Impersonal, objective writing is strong writing. Why? Because it's easy to dismiss personal opinion, but it's much harder to dismiss evidence and logical reasoning. When we combine that with tentative language, we also show that we understand that not everything is black and white. And that makes our writing even stronger. See you next time.